Good evening. It's September 17th, 2024, and we're continuing our collection of discussions in our Outside the Class series. It's a series from the Bible Project about the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. On the SCB.com, the Outside the Class section, we have these source videos set up for your review. Because the intent of Outside the Class for you to listen to that in-class lecture first. They will be found in the source video playlist. We're going to try to keep these to about 15 minutes, easy to catch, and catch up on. So we're on a quest, scroll by scroll, book by book, a journey through this collection, but with a fun and different twist on Outside the Class, on the Dusty Feet. And before we forget, if you find these kinds of podcasts useful, then click the subscribe button. The reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, then click that like button, because that is how YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. So in this series, we're going to cover the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. Yet, we're going to do it in the original order of this collection, the Hebrew Scriptures order. So, it could get real interesting once we get past the first five. Remember, the videos we're going to be discussing, they're just the tip of the iceberg. They are part of a learning series that I highly recommend, and they can all be found on the Bible Project website, and of course, on our source video playlists. Because we're going to be asking many questions about all kinds of things. But answers? We'll see. Leviticus, Vaikra. Part 1. So we need to remember that from actually chapter 19 through the entire scroll of Leviticus and into the beginning of Numbers, we are at one location. We are at the base of Mount Sinai. So this particular scroll, Vaikra or Leviticus, this is the bulk of that. We're going to talk about instructions, but I know in that light, right, um, we're going to ensure that we cover what Tim mentions in this video as well. Because I'm, I'm going to differ with Tim on how he portrays these in instructions a bit, right? Because I think this is how God expects them, right, the priests and the people, to act towards him in his presence and in individual and communal ways. These are instructions here. These are guide instructions. No, there's no doubt of that, but it's about being an example to others because it's from the outside looking in. So again, the reason I take a little exception is that God, God stays. He stays with them the entire time. God is with them, even to the point of exile. He's still there. I mean, yes, he did occupy when he chose to sit on his throne there was the Ark of the Covenant. That throne, yeah, that was his. It's either in the tabernacle or the temple. He gets his space. But they, these children of Israel, they are learning about this God, this yod heh vav -Hey, right? This is classroom time. It's time to learn. It's time to explore. I think they are acting like we would act. Actually, I'm going to put it out there that we actually do act. Yet God was with them the entire time, as he will teach them, because he wants to be closer to them, to have a different relationship with them than they have been taught about any other gods. Because one of the most significant differences is that God wants us to treat others like he treats us. Because our actions will reflect his actions, right? This covenant that they're going to agree to, it would be unlike anything that they've ever seen or heard of before. Because it offers life and death in a very different way. I mean, remember, we have this point that Jesus makes much further down the road when he's asked about the greatest of these covenant instructions, right? These commandments. He said, love God with all that you are, and we see this expressed in various commandments, and loving your neighbor as yourself, again, 
expressed in multiple commandments too. You know, from my experience and my study, I cannot find any commandment, any of them that do not fit underneath those two. But we need to remember this is an origin story, not unlike the garden. That's another origin story that you're probably very familiar with. But I do have a bit of a difference uh, how Tim views this, right? Because I think it's kind of fundamental. It's a common phrase that we hear that they failed, right? Fingers pointed. And I tend to believe that we are them, they are us. It's a very different focal point. Because I think we need to remember that as we get into the scroll of Leviticus, this is where it's going to take us on this fascinating journey. We'll get to look into what covenant people can look like. Remember, we've talked about that. That We mentioned this uh, b before, the, um, the set apart, right? The unique part of being holy. So when we get to the children and they're called to be set apart, unique, holy, they've already been declared by God as set apart. He already said that. But now he says, I've declared this. Now I need you to look the part. That's an exciting thought, actually, isn't it? To look the part. Because I think sometimes we don't consider how we look to the nations. You know, holy, unique, really something set apart, something different than what the rest are. That makes it interesting. When Tim goes and he, he talks about the space around that God's holy and I agree with that, but with some additional caveats. Because this whole land is his space, right? He, he comes to commune in that spot in the tabernacle. But this entire land that he's promised, this is the kingdom of God here on earth. At that time, in that land, he said, this is my kingdom. You will occupy it. You're to be my representatives. You will represent me. This is my land, my kingdom. The instructions that I will give you are my will on earth. And I expect you to represent me like the unique, set-apart, holy God that I am. You should reflect and look like me. So this is a challenge, right? Because we've tended to, in our churchanity way of things, we kind of we kind of toss this part out the door, right? We've been told that these instructions, they're not needed. And that the borderlines on something where Jesus says, because um, we get this mentioned later on when we get into Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is talking in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. So depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So now we're here at the origin story thousands of years before, and we're being introduced to those things that will decide what lawless looks like. We know that they're booted out of the land for this very reason, right? For being lawless. But that was both in practice and heart. So we want us to try to put ourselves in their sandals, because I think it's going to be a valuable way to approach it. Possibly, um, so that every time when, when God says, Israel, put on the sandals, put us in that setup. He's talking about what they will do, those expectations. So put ourselves in those sandals. I think we're going to start to look at this differently instead of us, them, separate, as in they couldn't. 
now why we wouldn't, can't, don't. Then we hear Tim and he mentions dealing with their, with their lust and their evil. Yeah, it's wrong. It's not only their wrong, though. It's our wrong as well. So what we have on, a, on our church entity side again is somebody said, uh, doesn't matter what you do now because God forgave it all, right? So what do you do? You've already got this get-out-of-jail-free card. But we see the stories in our scriptures. They just don't seem to go along with that. Because this part that we're delving into, this design phase of a kingdom of God, it's going to give us much to ponder. Because I suspect most of us probably haven't read Leviticus. We've only covered Leviticus. We've heard what somebody told us about it. Or we balked at part of it due to the lenses that we wore going into it. And I think part of that is out of ignorance, right? Some might be out of their fear because of what if we read it, right? What if we looked at it? What if we took any consideration? Then that could get interesting. Remember, we still have challenges even reading it and learning about it, deciding to embrace it. I mean, there's still going to be many challenges we have to work through. Those are things we're going to have to discuss. But viewing our choices and then living with an understanding that there's an accountability for our choices. I like the responsibility for our choices and how we can do this and we can say, hey, those are your choices. These are my choices. We're both accountable whichever way we go. Because God's going to sort this all out for us anyway, right? I mean, we also get that, just like God sorted it out for them in their time. God will do the same with ours. Those verses in Matthew, actually as well as the entire Sermon on the Mount, it echoes in our ears. I mean, these two Mount events are connected by the Father's will. His will on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to give you a glaring example. It's the tabernacle. I mean, Moses, he's taken into heaven to see the tabernacle so that it can be done here on earth as well. Yeah? Because these scrolls, they're essential to our development, to our growth as these followers of God. Because remember, Jesus is saying, you need to follow my Father. He is the way. This is the way. Follow my Father. It's built on the Torah. That's the expectation. We read the Sermon on the Mount, that other tied-in event, it's connected. You know, it's almost like a, a wormhole tunnel that connects these two. And it's evident when Jesus says, hey, just do what my Father says. Again, this started in chapter 19 of Exodus. You know, it's funny, it's in our episode with Carmen Imes that we talk about this. I mean, because she's excited, she's passionate about where Exodus is, will go with her. And we begin to explore, to open up, to develop this. From that point in Exodus, through the scroll of Leviticus, into Numbers, this one-year time frame at the foot of this mountain. Where does it take us? What does it teach us? And we're going to look at this with the literary design. We're going to see how it develops. Maybe where this design will help us grasp this nebulous number of 613. So we have the five main types of ritual sacrifices. And I love how Tim put it, that two of these ways are, let's say, thank you to God, right? The, the grain and the fellowship offerings. Do you ever think that in these types of sacrifices and the why, right? I mentioned this before, and I'm going to continue. One, why would I not 
want these to be part of my life? And two, how will the death of Messiah cause these not to matter? At least in my heart, yeah? But one of the challenging things we get is this post-tabernacle, this post-temple time. And yet, we still have the heart issues. Because I fully agree that they're gone. Many of those ritual activities that are part of it, they cannot and should not be practiced. But you know, that's not the reason they were removed from the land for not, not carrying out the ritual activities. It was always about their heart. But now, we're just at the beginning. We're in kindergarten, just learning things that we're going to need to know and how to behave. I mean, we're going to get to the literary structure in this scroll. It's exquisite Hebrew. It's focused in the middle of a chiasm, capped at the end. This is, okay, so this is not a cheat or a spoiler alert. At the end of the scroll, chapter 26, we're going to get a rendering of the promises of God. It reminds us that God's promises can go both ways. I mean, in this chapter, the first 13 verses are blessings with a mix of literal and metaphorical. The last 33, those verses are the curses. And again, both literal and metaphorical. And yet when I read that chapter, I honestly ask myself, does that remind me of anything? Leviticus, Vaikra. We're going to continue next week with more of the literary structure and how it's going to drive us towards a focal point and maybe get a little glimpse more of ourselves. So, thank you for being with us tonight on another episode of Outside the Class, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, on the Dusty Feet.